Ladies and gentlemen, as normal in this Red Gaming Telecom video, we're going to have a tech news roundup of all the various events that's going on in the tech and gaming industry. We've got a couple of major points that's going on today. The first is that AMD are starting to ship the Radeon 400 series of GPUs in April. However, these are only going to be specifically for the mobile versions of the products at least from what we know at the moment we'll get into that in just a moment and then we're going to finish things off with steam because it has actually released its own version of a benchmark which will give you an indication of how your system will manage to perform with virtual reality but first things first amd so this information comes to us actually from the novo who are of course a fairly well known fairly well revered laptop and um, computer manufacturer they are naturally readying their next generation of laptops. So, it's a fairly lengthy statement, I'll read it out however. Thanks to the stylish new design, later weight and up to 50% uh, improvement in battery life, the new Yoga 510 delivers up to 8.5 hours of battery life and lets users say goodbye to sitting on the floor tied to an outlet. Similar to the Yoga 710, the, the new Yoga 510 delivers a smooth transition between laptop, stand, tent and tablet modes lighter than only 1.75 kg and 2.08 kg and that's for the 15 inch model as opposed to the 14 inch. Its new design has a unique diamond cut palm rest and powered by up to the 6th generation Intel Core i7 processors with an optional AMD Radeon R7 M60 2GB graphics. The Yoga 510 has serious performance chops for working and multitasking. There are a variety of different GPUs and options available. The ones that we're specifically targeting, this is no longer a quote, just for FYI. The ones that we're specifically targeting in this um, video, however, are the Yoga 5101 14 inch laptop, which is going to. Um, be available in April and also the 5101 15 inch laptop which is also going to be available once again in April. Now the primary difference between the two models is obviously going to be the overall the hardware that's inside of it as well as the screen size. Both screens are going to be 1080p but for our purposes the primary difference between the laptops in this specific instance is the GPU. One features the R5 M430 while the other features an R7 M460. So what does that mean? Well first of all it's very likely that the M430 is going to be a rebrand. It's not 100% but it's looking pretty darn likely that it's a rebrand but that low level of performance and it's let's face it it's not going to be pushing you know Far Cry Primal at 4k at 60 fps with that type of GPU therefore it makes sense for it to be a rebrand particularly given the price point and the other uh, shinies however the other GPU the other card which is the R7 um, once again, it's the R7 M460. Potentially, one of those could be, well, actually, it could be one of the Western and Banks GPUs, which we saw uh, codenamed in the Zuba shipping database. Unfortunately, like everything that we've been talking about at the moment, AMD are remaining fairly tight-lipped, and so we can only speculate so there's two possibilities. The first is that it is essentially a Polaris based GPU. In other words, it will be 14 nm, it will have all of the shiners, it will be faster, and it will be more power efficient. The other is it, yes, is a 400 series card, but just like the 300 series, it's essentially a rebrand. Now, that's not to say that rebrands can't have some performance improvements. For example, the 300 series did have a few additions to the architecture, it has slightly higher clock speeds, that type of thing, which did bump up performance, but essentially it was very much the same GPU. If you picked up the R9-390X, you've basically got a very similar GPU to, you know, your buddy Tom, who has an R9-290X. Polaris, however, does have some substantial differences. Remember, it is essentially the fourth iteration of the GCN architecture from AMD. Now, we have actually 
once again gone through three other generations of GCN. The first is pretty obvious, it would be the the same GPUs that you'd see in like the 7000 series. And then we saw the types that were in the 200 series, and then we've since then seen Tonga with, and each of these has had some successive differences, small differences in cache, small differences in, let's say, compression, small differences in power and heat and other shiny bits. But with the fourth, fourth generation, excuse me, there were going to be some substantial changes. Now, some of those are improvements to hardware scheduling, instruction prefetch, improved shader efficiency, better memory compression, even though, once again, Tonga does offer much better memory compression. They've gone a step further. And finally, primitive discard accelerator. If you're wondering what half of that bloody stuff means, essentially it just means improvements to efficiency. For example, hardware scheduler means that the GPU should much better be able to handle the instructions that are sent to it and be able to issue those across multiple shaders. Shader efficiency, I don't really think I need to explain that. It just means that the shaders, the GPUs, that all processors are going to be more efficient. Memory compression, once again, it basically means the data that's floating around in the memory is going to be better suited and better compressed so that, and obviously that will be lossless compression. It's not like, a, let's not say, it's like a, a zip file as opposed to, let's say, a JPEG. A JPEG image, obviously, you have some lossy compression, therefore, you're going to start getting some color artifacting or what have you. Whereas, on the other hand, with like a zip file, it simply compresses the file. And that's very much the way that, obviously, GPU manufacturers are trying to go. And with all of the other things as well, essentially it's basically trying to make sure that when a scene is being set up, when the GPU is rendering a certain frame of animation, basically it wants to be as efficient about it as possible. I always give this example, but let's say that you're rendering a building. There's no point drawing a building that's partial, or parts of the building that are partially blocked by, let's say, a car or a truck, because it's basically pissing away performance. If the if the GPU is rendering a frame that the player is unable to see behind or part of the image that the uh, player is unable to see behind they're just basically wasting cycles so in that manner the earlier you can actually discard that the earlier you can actually nuke that the earlier you can stop that from happening and the gpu from wasting its processing power the more efficient and more frugal the gpu can be in actually sending out its resources to other things so it can better utilize let's say caches or shaders or what have you to actually process data which is going to be valuable and data which is going to improve the scene there are some other changes as we know for the polaris architecture it's obviously going to be much more power efficient and also going to offer hdmi 2.0a and better hardware decoding it's going to offer h2.65 these are all according to amd these are not random rumors this this stuff has actually been 100 percent confirmed but once again whether this particular version of the lenovo Pro, uh, gpu whether the r7 m460 is going to offer that or whether it's once again just going to simply be a rebrand we unfortunately do not know the answer, so it's just kind of up in the air. It could, however, as I mentioned, be Western and Banks, but this card does only come with two gigabytes of video memory, which is, I won't go as far as to say it's anemic, but given the pricing that Lenovo are aiming the, this uh, particular piece of hardware at, I can kind of see why. I mean, for example, if you were to look at the main system memory, it offers up to eight gigabytes of memory and up to one terabyte hard drive 15 inch ips touchscreen and all of the other regular bits you'd expect and on obviously a sixth generation i7 however that processor can go considerably lower i believe it's down to a pentium which obviously is not particularly conducive to high performance gaming now steam vr it's kind of a big deal. We all know that the Oculus Rift and HTC Vive, the specifications, have finally made it into the wild and we know roughly what it's going to take to drive them. However, some folks may not be too familiar with the hardware that's actually running in their system or perhaps they just want something more than just on-screen text to tell them. 
Well, there is SteamVR performance test which has popped up on the Steam Store page. What this aims to do is quite simply, it runs a series of tests on your system and then will give you at least an indication of how your system will perform. Unsurprisingly, systems with a better GPU are outperforming those with a better CPU but with a lower end GPU. Which is not particularly unsurprising. Folks, for example, who have something along the lines of an FX 8350 are doing better if they've got a high end GPU, let's say, for example, a Fury or a GTX 980 tie, something like that, than folks who have, let's say, a GTX 960 and a. 5820k. I'm just pulling something out of my butt, but you can kind of get the idea. Whether this is going to be indicative of reality is down to your personal, or de rather down to developers. Essentially, however, as you can probably guess at the moment, most games are probably going to be GPU bound, because simply because of the number of pixels that those cards are being asked to actually render. Obviously, your experience may slightly vary based upon the application, once again, you're asking the card to run, or rather the hardware to run, but you can kind of at least get an idea with this of how it's going to, you know, function on your system. With all of that said, hopefully you have enjoyed the fairly short for me, actually, video. I'll see you soon. Take care. Bye for now.